All right, wonderful. No disclosures to report to all of you today. For the presentation today, I have a couple of things I wanna share. I wanna talk a little bit about what the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative is and how we are approaching it. There are a couple of key focus areas and components of the initiative that um, might be of potential interest to all of you, and I wanted to share that. Part of that discussion is around really thinking about where there are connections between various systems. As I share with you about some of the work at the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, it is very much focused as a systems change initiative that is really meant to create more integration and connection that centers the experiences, the needs, and the strengths and priorities of children, youth, and families themselves. And there, we're, we're still in some early planning phases of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiatives, but I wanted to share some resources and some next steps in terms of the work we're doing and, and how folks can engage with it over time. So um, let me just start with this slide by noting that the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative um, was created in a particular context. And that context was very deep commitment by this administration, by the governor, um, around improving behavioral health for all Californians. And recognizing that that transformation that is needed needs to be holistic and comprehensive, including thinking about the social determinants of health. And um, so there are a series of initiatives that the state has undertaken over the last few years and is continuing to propose going forward to really look at improving behavioral health for all Californians. And um, last year, the leadership under the leadership of the governor and the state legislature, this new Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative was created as part of that overall work to um, improve the well being of all Californians. And I just wanted to share this slide because these are the guiding principles that um, underpin all of the work of Cal HHS. And I hope that what you will see is that is true of this initiative as well. So these guiding principles are also guiding the work of this initiative that I'm going to share a bit more with you about today. So I want to spend a couple of minutes on this slide. This is really um, sort of the heart of the vision, and I and I um, want to share with you a bit about the initiative and, and how we're working to approach it. Um, so as you can see here, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, it's a five-year $4.4 billion initiative is meant to reimagine the systems that support social emotional well being and behavioral health into a more coordinated, equitable, upstream prevention oriented ecosystem. It is for all children and youth ages zero to 25. And it is, it is very intentional around the focus on all children and youth zero to 25. And embedded in that is a targeted universalism approach where we have shared goals for the well being of all our children. And we also recognize that certain groups face more systemic barriers, more challenges, more issues to achieve that well being, and that we will need targeted strategies um, and approaches that address those more significant barriers and systemic barriers that some face to well being. And we also know. This was certainly true before the pandemic, but we also know this was exacerbated by the pandemic, that there are um, certain groups that we are seeing continued um, concerns, but also trends really going in the right wrong direction in terms of mental health and well-being for our children, youth of color, our LGBTQ plus youth, and other um, certain underserved and low-income communities um, where um, mental health and well-being were significant concerns before the pandemic, but clearly that has been exacerbated. And I won't go through all the data around that because I know you all know that very well. Another important takeaway from this slide is that the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative is a systems change initiative. Um, I've been in my role since the middle of November and my a lot of my background is in policy and systems change work. And in the couple of months, I have been out talking with many folks if there is a singular theme that emerges from those conversations, it is the um, deep recognition and desire that we use the opportunity of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative to address the silos in our systems. That the um, 
that sort of busting up those silos is one of the most important things we can do as part of reimagining an ecosystem that truly centers the voices, the needs, the experiences, the priorities of children, youth, and families. And a recognition that that is not just systems within health and human services, although that it does include a variety of systems within health and human services, but it also really needs to be a cross-sector initiative that looks across the various sectors um, of the lives of children and youth and how they affect social and emotional well-being. And that means the initiative is deeply grounded in partnership, in collaboration, in really setting a table that brings all of the stakeholders, partners, experts together to reimagine this ecosystem, not just by making maybe individual changes to individual programs, but actually thinking together, how might we reorganize the components, the puzzle pieces of our system in a way that is truly not, not centering, many partners have said to me, it often seems like we are centering the needs of the system or the proclivities of the system, the way certain programs operate or the way funding works or the way certain policy and regulations work. And that the really hard, hard work before us is to turn that upside down and shift that center to children and youth and families and think about how we organize the system around their needs, their priorities and improving their um, lives and outcomes. As part of the initiative in order to accomplish that, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we are really working to build a very intentional approach to engaging the voice and the participation of children, youth, and families in the development and the design of the work of the initiative. I also want to note that this initiative is intended to address the full continuum of care all the way from building a stronger, more upstream primary prevention oriented ecosystem through the full range of services and approaches across the continuum, including improving um, outcomes and access to behavioral health um, supports and services for our children and youth that have the most complex and the most intensive needs. And I wanna recognize here that a lot of that work is, is already under discussion and happening at a variety of different tables and through different efforts. The Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative is not trying to um, duplicate that. It is very much around how do we also connect to other efforts and other initiatives that are already ongoing and build partnership, build collaboration to create this ecosystem together. We're not trying to create another silo that is the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. We are very clear that it is situated in a larger context of a lot of work that is, that is already happening to improve behavioral health for children and youth. And really thinking about how do we utilize the, the tools and the approaches that are embedded within this specific initiative to connect with those other tables and really together work on building that ecosystem. And I, I want to be clear, we know that the kind of um, collaboration and systems change we're talking about requires deep partnership requires trust um, and requires very hard work because we know that amazing work is already happening to address behavioral health and improve social emotional well-being of children and youth all across California with, by amazing dedicated professionals and leaders. There are many bright spots and best practices that have emerged. What, what part of our work before us is, is how do we really make those bright spots and those best practices and the incredible work that is happening into something that is more systemic, that is scalable, and that is sustainable over time. And that is some of the key aspects of the work of the initiative that we hope to be doing together. I also want to be clear that we recognize California, obviously, is a very large and complex state, as you all know. So part of the work of the initiative is articulating a state-level framework for this reimagined behavioral health ecosystem with the recognition that it will be implemented and executed at the local level in ways that look different across the state. Um, but, but doing that work, thinking about it in a very connected bi-directional way between how the work is organized at the systems level locally and what state level frameworks can support that or and sometimes create barriers, how do we work through those issues? That is part of the work of the initiative. And it, it really is meant to be a whole of government, whole of society, comprehensive approach to thinking about the ecosystem that supports well-being for our children and youth. 
So I'm going to just um, share this slide. I've touched on most of these issues, but I just want you to see um, these are the areas and sort of the underpinnings of when we are in this stage of planning and design around the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. These are the underpinnings that are guiding um, the work that we are doing um, at Cal HHS through our departments, across state agencies, and with our partners in the field. I talk a little bit about how we are approaching doing this work of redesigning and reimagining the ecosystem. I mentioned this first one, we are focusing on the entire continuum of care. There's a very strong recognition that we have to increase the capacity of the system itself. And I'll share some of the ways in which uh, we are working to do that through the Behavioral Health, um, Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. One of the key ones is related to workforce and I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we are really working to um, approach this initiative where we are centering the voice and the experiences of children, youth, and families as a part of the guide and North Star of how we do this work together. It's a very strong recognition that we need to address stigma and support um, children and youth in accessing the supports and services that they need. And this last bullet is probably the most important one on this slide. The Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, as I mentioned, it's a five-year initiative. It's a $4.4 billion initiative. Most of the funds in the initiative are one-time funds that are really meant to be a catalyst for thinking about how do we reimagine and begin this work of redesigning and system streams that um, uh, really creates the architecture and builds up the infrastructure and builds up our capacity to function as a more integrated, coordinated, equity-centered ecosystem to support social emotional well-being and behavioral health of children and youth in California. So this catalyst role is a very important um, part of the work of the initiative. So where are we at in the work of the initiative? Because this was passed in last year's state budget, so we're still in the early days of the work. We really see the work in these three main phases. Um, much of the work that's still happening right now is in phase one, where we are in sort of standing up just the infrastructure of the initiative itself, developing five-year outcomes goals for the initiative, putting in place how we're going to do this work across state government, but also very importantly, how we're going to be engaging stakeholders and partners across the state uh, and in the field around this work. There is also work though that has already moved into the second phase. You'll, you'll see pretty soon, I'll share with you a slide that shows there are 14 work stream components that make up the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. And they are all on uh, sort of different timelines. They, they are housed in different departments of state government, but we are working very hard to coordinate across all of them. Um, but they are on different timelines. So some of the work is already in this phase two work and more and more of the work will be moving into this um, phase two in the coming weeks and months. So I wanted to pause for a second and pose this discussion question if folks would like to share some thoughts in the chat. Um, I would really welcome this. As I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, we see the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative's effort to build an ecosystem as meaning it's not just a self-contained body of work with those 14 work streams in the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. Those are the tools that we have under this initiative that we will be focused on to reimagine and redesign and build up this architecture and infrastructure for a reimagined ecosystem, but not doing that in a vacuum, thinking about it in connection with other systems change efforts and initiatives that we know are going on, like the system of care work that is happening around foster youth. So if folks have any thoughts in that they would like to share in the chat around connections you see between your work with children and youth with developmental disabilities and who also have mental health and substance use or behavioral health needs, um, would really um, welcome learning about, hearing about those connections so that as we continue the work of engaging stakeholders, we can be folding in those opportunities for connection and integration across the ecosystem into our work. So I am gonna keep going because I'm not able to see the chat, but I will be looking forward to seeing the chat after the presentation and um, all of the thoughts and ideas that are shared. I wanted to dive in a little bit to the 
um, particular focus areas and components of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. I wanna share an overview of them and then there's just a couple of them that I would like to go into with a, a little bit more um, specificity. So as I mentioned, there are 14 work stream components that make up the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative over the, the work of the next five years. They're really grouped into these four areas, focusing on workforce training and capacity, building the behavioral health ecosystem infrastructure, thinking about coverage architecture and public awareness. And you can see that we, we put this across two slides so that it could actually be readable, but you can see some of the particular um, work stream components that fall under each of these areas. So I'll, I'll, I'll be going into a little bit more um, the first two in terms of workforce. So I won't speak to those now, but I'll, I wanna mention a few of the others. So you may be familiar with CalHOPE, which is, uh, um, it's many things, but it's a website, it's a phone line, it's a texting service that was stood up during COVID um, to support mental health and behavioral health needs of Californians during the incredibly um, stressful and challenging times of the pandemic. One of the programs of CalHOPE is actually connecting with schools and um, county offices of education and school districts to provide resources that support work that is happening in schools to support social emotional well-being of children and youth. And so that's, um, there's some investment in that program through this initiative. This next piece around um, pediatric primary care and other healthcare providers is particularly around um, information, training, and supports that will be related to the virtual services platform that I will talk about in a couple of minutes in a little bit more detail. Um, there is work happening through the California Office of the Surgeon General to develop trauma-informed training for educators. And this includes early learning, so early childhood um, care settings and learning settings, as well as in the K through 12 setting. As I mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the virtual services platform, so I won't talk about that here. There is also a grants program through the initiative um, to support and study and lift up and begin to um, possibly scale evidence-based and community-defined best practices um, related to supporting uh, social emotional well-being and behavioral health for children and youth. And that um, grant program is, has not been developed yet, but that is one of the components of the initiative. In terms of the behavioral health ecosystem infrastructure, um, there is a, another grant program that is part of the initiative. It's a $550 million program that is to um, support partnership, collaboration, development across key aspects between schools and the behavioral health system and, and its many components, community-based organizations, schools, uh, managed care plans, tribes, many different groups that could be a part of that. So the contours of that are in the, in the process of being defined. There's a series of stakeholder engagement meetings that will be happening over the next couple of months to help the Department of Health Services, who's the lead on this particular work stream to um, shape that program. The Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program is actually a much larger program than this initiative that is about investing in some of the bricks and mortar infrastructure we need to make sure we have the behavioral health services that we need in communities throughout California. There is a portion of this um, program that is specifically dedicated to children and youth services and infrastructure. And then the Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program is a program through the Department of Healthcare Services and our Medi-Cal program that is specifically focused on um, incentive payments to Medi-Cal managed care plans for developing partnerships and targeted interventions, working with uh, school districts throughout the state and other related partners in, in the community. And then the last two overall um, uh, sort of major components that the work streams fall under, one is related to coverage architecture. Uh, you may be aware that in last year's state budget as part of the initiative, there is a new Medi-Cal benefit um, that will be coming online next year in 2023 for dyadic services in the primary care setting. And also part of the initiative includes the development of an all-payer fee schedule for school-linked behavioral health services. So a set of services will be defined, a fee schedule be, will be attached to it, and it will apply to both Medi-Cal managed care plans and commercial health plans 
for schooling to behavioral health services. And then in the public awareness arena, there are two major campaigns that are part of the initiative. One, this first one is through the California Department of Public Health. It's a $100 million campaign that is really um, an education and change campaign around behavioral health for children and youth. And this um, campaign is just in the very early stages of being scoped out in terms of the approach. But I know one of the things that the CDPH is very focused on with this campaign is very much thinking about equity and taking targeted approaches that are um, culturally relevant, um, culturally appropriate, and really um, utilize this campaign to think about how do we advance equity in terms of behavioral health outcomes. And then the Office of the Surgeon General, as you all know, has done a lot of work around ACEs and ACEs work in the context of the primary care setting. This is more of a public awareness campaign related to ACEs, both what they are, but what are also strategies to both prevent and, and mitigate, mitigate and buffering support. So this is a public awareness campaign and there's an RFP out for it now and the Office of the Surgeon General will be selecting a partner to do this work with them in the next year. So let me focus on just um, a couple of those um, components that might be of um, potential deeper interest to you and that perhaps you would want to ask me some further questions about, although of course happy to talk about any of these components. I first wanted to focus a little bit on workforce because this is clearly such a significant issue in the field of behavioral health overall, but also specifically related to children and youth. You can see here from this slide, it is a very significant part of the investment of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative overall to focus on developing and building up the behavioral health workforce that we need. So the first part of it is the first set of investments through the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, as you can see here, are on the broad behavioral health workforce. And it's really to invest in a, a series of programs that really um, support a multidimensional approach to uh, behavioral health training and capacity expansion, looking at you know, loan repayment, scholarships, stipends, um, career pipelines, uh, specifically looking at investment in developing the substance use disorder workforce. So it's, it is really a, um, a layered approach trying to build up through um, existing and some new programs looking at the broad behavioral health workforce. There's also a very strong intention in that work to developing a workforce that is more diverse, um, more culturally aligned with California and with um, supporting our children and youth. The second body of work around workforce in the initiative is around behavioral health coaches and counselors. And this idea of a behavioral health coach is a new role in the ladder of uh, behavioral health workforce roles. And we're currently, um, the this is this work around workforce, all of this work on workforce is being led by the Healthcare Access and Information Department, which used to be known as OSHPED. I know many of our, us, myself included, are familiar with it as OSHPED, but its name was recently changed to Healthcare Access and Information, or HCI. Um, and so HCI has begun work doing research um, really across the, the nation, but even beyond in terms of what this role could look like, and then is starting to talk with um, stakeholders, including youth and families themselves, but also many other partners and stakeholders around, well, what should this behavioral health coach role look like? Um, it's envisioned to, to be in a few locations, but particularly in school-based settings, but also potentially other settings as well, and really trying to imagine what should this um, coach role be. And some of the thinking right now is that um, it is really around engaging directly with children and youth, um, very much focused on being sort of grounded in community and in um, settings such as schools where children and youth are, really thinking about a behavioral health coach workforce that is diverse and bringing lived experience to the work, um, addressing some of the gaps we know we have um, in the behavioral health workforce overall. So a lot of thoughts going into what should be the level of education and training and how this role could also serve as um, part of a career path and a career ladder to bring more people into other behavioral health professions that may require master's degrees and beyond. Um, and also really um, thinking about how it can also be, be though a sustainable role in terms of um, how the positions are paid for and how they are financed and that it's really um, 
you know, a living wage for people. So that's the work that's happening. So significant investments in workforce through the initiative. And then I wanted to talk about one other of the, the work streams, and that is the behavioral health um, virtual services platform that is um, a part of the initiative. You can see here that it's really a multifunctional design with a series of um, capabilities and capacities that the um, virtual services platform is envisioned um, to hold. Um, the work on this is just starting. The concepts you see here are what were included as possibilities in the legislation. There is a think tank being formed by the Department of Healthcare Services to help inform and guide and shape the development of the platform. And there will also be a number of stakeholder engagement, you know, listening sessions, workshops. Um, this is definitely something Department of Healthcare Services has been very clear. This is not a platform that's if you build it, they will come. This is meant to be a platform that is deeply centered on what we hear from children, youth, and families they want and need out of the platform in order to support um, social emotional well being, getting the supports they need, getting connected to um, services. There's one particular piece that I want to call out. Um, with you all, and that is the e-consult piece. I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, the e-consult approach. Um, and there are um, places, including at UCSF and around the country, that are doing e-consult work related to children and youth behavioral health and connecting primary care uh, providers, including pediatricians, to uh, behavioral health expertise for children and youth in order to support their capability to address the growing mental health and behavioral health needs of um, uh, children in primary care practices. And so part of that program is envisioned to be connected through this virtual services platform. I mentioned this a minute ago, so um, Department of Healthcare Services is launching these two think tanks on these two particular work streams. Um, applications were just due for those um, earlier this week. And so um, those will be coming out soon in terms of the work of those think tanks. I do wanna be clear, the think tanks aren't the only way though to engage. There will be other opportunities for stakeholders to provide input um, on these and all of the other work streams as well. Um, and so then here, another discussion question if folks have some thoughts that they would want to share in the chat, it would be really great to hear if there are any of those streams in particular um, that you see in relation to your work for children and youth with um, developmental needs that also have um, mental health and behavioral health needs? Are there particular work streams that are of greatest interest to you or where you see that important connections could and should be made as we are thinking about this more integrated ecosystem upstream prevention oriented equitable approach? So folks have a few thoughts to share in the chat. That would be terrific. And I will look forward to um, receiving them. I wanna close by just sharing a little bit about our stakeholder engagement plan um, so that you are aware of some of the ways in which if you are interested that you could continue to be um, updated and connected with the work of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. Um, a couple of areas that we are focusing on, particularly at the initiative level, so within CalHHS at the agency level, we currently have a stakeholder engagement plan around developing the five-year outcomes goals for the initiative. There's cross-cutting issues that are continually coming up where we are looking to form perhaps some working groups um, around equity, around prevention and wellness, around really what does this integrated ecosystem look like? How do we connect the dots between some of these systems? So more to come on that. And then we're also really working to do strong coordination between the stakeholder engagement that's happening for the initiative overall, as well as for those work, particular work streams that I mentioned. So there are some near-term activities that are happening. This, these series of focus groups on the five-year outcomes goals for the initiatives are both focus groups with children, youth, and families, and parents themselves um, through working with a series of trusted partners on the ground who are engaging with children, youth, and families, as well as um, in a series of professional stakeholder groups. We had a focus group session at the Behavioral Health Task Force, the Governor's Behavioral Health Task Force earlier this month. We we're doing that with some other standing groups and committees in both the health and education arenas. Um, 
And then I also mentioned there's a, a number of outreach activities and engagement forums happening for some of the particular work streams. And then we are really also working to try to make sure that we are having as broad of a reach we can about sharing about the work and the updates, even though we're in the very early stages of the initiative. Um, we held a kickoff webinar um, last week around the initiative. I think we had about 800 people on the webinar and I'll, in a moment I'll show you, and I know the slides when they're shared with you will have the links to our website where you can connect if you could watch the recording as well as see the slides that we used in that kickoff webinar. It was a two hour webinar, so it provided quite a bit more detail than even I was able to share with you today about the initiative and some of the its particular components. And then this is some of the longer term work that we will be doing in the coming months and years around stakeholder engagement, including we are working to hold this summer COVID allowing in person sessions in a couple of communities across the state to really dig into if we were to be successful at building this more integrated ecosystem, what would be different about the system? What stories might children, youth and families and providers and partners tell in five years about how this ecosystem better supports the behavioral health and social emotional well-being of all of California's children and youth? Um, and really wanting to anchor our work toward working backwards from that vision from those systems changes that most need to be made and from the outcome schools. And then just to note, because I did mention that we are very much looking to center engagement with children, youth and families as part of the work. We did a series of expert interviews in January and February with organizations across the state who work directly with children, youth and families around organizing, leadership development, advocacy, systems change work, and ask them if we want to do authentic, meaningful children, youth, and family engagement ongoing as a part of this initiative, how should we do it? And we got amazing um, generosity of conversations, of insights, of reflections, of advice, of lessons learned that we are looking to put into practice with our approach. So um, some of the key elements of that approach is um, we will be working with a network of partners who do this work, who are trusted in their communities that reflect the diversity of California, geographically, economically, racially, and ethnically, all of the ways trying to capture the full range of diversity across California through the network of partners we will have for this work. Um, we will be working to engage them over time. It's not just a one-time approach. It's really thinking about how do we at certain moments of touch points really um, engage with these partners so that we are hearing from children, youth and families in the design, the planning, the development and ultimately the implementation of the work of the initiative. And also how do we over time work to move more up the engagement ladder? Often, as you know, government is doing engagement at the level of seeking input. And um, if you're familiar with the engagement ladder, sort of how do we move up that engagement ladder where are there some opportunities maybe for some co-design work or other ways in which we can engage um, children, youth and families as partners in this work. And then just to conclude, I wanted to share a couple of resources here. Um, the webpage for the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. You can see our email address here if you would like to sign up for our um, stakeholder list so you receive our updates regularly. We do try to provide regular updates. We're actually just putting the finishing touches on our next update that should go out in the next week or two. Um, I wanted you to have the link to the survey application even though they were already due that that page though um, DHCS does also have a specific web page for the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative that will include over time information about stakeholder engagement. And then this last bullet may seem a little bit odd given that I've just spent this time talking about the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, but um, in preparing for today, one of the things that um, Dr. Crane and others shared with me is a very strong interest of this group in also thinking about um, older adults and um, the intersection of um, developmental disabilities and behavioral health. And I just wanted to share that um, California has a relatively new master plan for aging, which some of you may be familiar with. And I'm certain that if next year you wanted to invite folks from the, who are working on the California Master Plan for Aging to talk about the work they are doing around behavioral health, that they would welcome the opportunity. So with that, I will close and thank you for having me. Thank you for 
exceptional talk, Melissa, and for rising to the occasion at the 11th hour. We really appreciate it. This is really an exciting uh, uh, initiative and uh, you have generated um, more questions than anybody in the two days <laughs> of this conference. And Galen assures me that she will be saving the questions and those in the chat for you and you will be a busy lady addressing all of those uh, or even a percentage of them. One uh, that I will um, convey to you, uh, there were several about the um, pathetic lack of child and adolescent psychiatrists and the lack of um, uh, acute psychiatric hospitals. And another um, really uh, concerning aspect of that is that many psychiatric hospitals in California are refusing to admit youth or children or adults with um, intellectual or developmental disabilities because they don't know where to send them when they're ready for discharge. Comments? Yes, thank you for lifting that up. So want to note that when I talked about that general behavioral health workforce investment, that does include programs through HCRI that specifically address psychiatrists and child and adolescent psychiatrists. So there is funding available for programs that support loan repayment, other approaches through that um, initiative. So again, I don't, I can't go into all the details around it given our timing, but that is available. And if you um, look at some of the materials from HI, you will see some of that, but that is definitely a recognition part of the investment that is possible through um, that general broad behavioral health workforce investment as part of the Children Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. You may also know that the governor proposed in his budget for this year even further investments in the care workforce, including in behavioral health. So there's a strong recognition of the need for investment in the behavioral health workforce. And then with respect to really appreciate you lifting up and sharing with me some of the gaps in terms of services, I want to return to that behavioral health continuum infrastructure program. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, the children, there was a webinar recently specifically on the children's portion. This is led by the Department of Healthcare Services. So you can find this information on the DHCF website. Um, there was a webinar specifically about the children and youth component of that program. And if memory serves, so I might not have this quite right, but if memory serves, it's anticipated that the applications for that program for funding specifically for behavioral health or bricks and mortar infrastructure services for children and youth, I believe is coming out in August of this year. But don't quote me on that because I don't have it in front of me, but I, I believe it's August. So um, there will be an opportunity to invest in some of the bricks and mortar infrastructure we need specifically for children and youth behavioral health services. Thank you. Jerry, did you pick up a couple that you wanted to address by Melissa? It, it, yeah, it's actually pretty overwhelming. Uh, I think you're going <laughs> to really need a pot of coffee uh, or tea to go through all of the comments. This is something that's really important to uh, the folks in this community. Um, and I will say the workforce capacity, you know, it starts really early in terms of training, both for uh, physicians as well as nurse practitioners and other behavioral health staff. So I think um, uh, the investment needs to be one that's an early investment in order to attract people to the field um, and um, provide enough resources so it does not feel so terribly overwhelming, which it is right now. The state of things is really overwhelming. Um, one last one that I'll bring, excuse me, Jerry. Yeah, go ahead. One last one I'll bring up um, is actually a leftover question from yesterday that uh, links with several of those today. Uh, supports are needed for help with placement of youths and children with challenging psychiatric problems and behaviors. Um, the question yesterday had to do with uh, the regional center feeling that its hands were tied in terms of some challenging youth that they had placed at very rural settings in near Lodi or several miles from <laughs> Lodi and in the Central Valley where there were no services uh, to speak of that were needed by these youth. I think we have a real problem 
in terms of acute psychiatric uh, and disturbing uh, behaviors. So your initiative goes for what, five years? That's right. What are the state's plans to continue? Because the problem with most pilot projects, no matter how good they are, and this sounds terrific, they're good for a limited time. Yeah, and I really appreciate that question because in some ways it really goes to that catalyst role of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. So there are certain components of it that are initial investments like the workforce investment to say, we know we have this gap, we need to build up the workforce. And is that is what we're doing here likely to be enough for the long term? No, but it is really meant to be sort of an injection of significant resources into building the behavioral health workforce. And to Jerry's incredibly important point, there are specific investments in pipeline programs, like mm -hmm. reaching down to high school. There are mm -hmm. specific investments in earn and learn programs. I was on the <clears> phone <throat> with the California Community Colleges yesterday and learning about their student ambassador program and brainstorming about how that might actually connect to some of the other workforce um, opportunities that might emerge, including the behavioral health coaches. So I think there's a very strong <clears throat> commitment to your point around we need to build the pipeline. So these are some initial investments that are really meant to be catalytic to build up the infrastructure capability of the system and do that work of really rethinking how the puzzle pieces fit together. One of the things we hear a lot is that these silos get in the way of not only families getting what they need, of children and youth getting what they need, but it really does not allow us to achieve the best outcomes for our children and youth. Mm -hmm. Simply not possible when we're this siloed. And so part of the work of the initiative is creating the opportunity for us together to figure out some of that and do it differently. And part of figuring out is what you have raised, Dr. Crane, which is the sustainability model. Mm -hmm. So that is on our mind right now. What is the sustainability model? One of the pieces is something I mentioned around the all payer approach that it is embedded in the initiative for school linked services. So there are behavioral health services provided on or near school campuses now that um, under this new fee schedule and this um, regulatory infrastructure that is being created, would be able to be billed to both Medi-Cal and commercial insurance, depending on the child's um, health insurance coverage. So that is one, it's not the only, but that is one key aspect. There's a whole related body of work that I'm guessing many of you are familiar with in Medi-Cal called CalAIM, which is also doing a lot of work around rethinking behavioral health policy and funding with a very strong commitment to a no wrong door approach, um, specifically thinking about that for children and youth as well. So um, that, that work also relates to sustainability and the ways in which Medi-Cal is looking through CalAIM to adjust policy and reimbursement for behavioral health services. There was a, um, a state plan amendment through the Medi-Cal approved not too long ago um, that actually enhances the ability of schools to receive Medi-Cal funding to support behavioral health services. So you are absolutely right that we have work to do on sustainability, but it is front and center in our work and on our minds, even from day one of the initiative. I wanna leave you with one quick thought, which one of the, one of the um, audience members posted this, which is thinking about prevention. Uh, we need to think about some of the root causes of physical and mental health, which is poverty. I know yes. I don't want you to respond to that. I just want to leave you with that thought because I think it is so important, again, to think about some of those root causes. And thank you so very much. This was enlightening. And I know that you're going to be busy reading all of those comments. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me.